public clouds. My name is Marcus Abdul with Vigilant Technologies and I will be your host today. Soon I'll be joined by our speaker for today's session, Solutions Architect, also with Vigilant, Amrita Mukherjee. Let's start today with a very brief discussion on who Vigilant Technologies is. We are a boutique global consultancy delivering advisory implementation and managed services for over 20 years. We are the quality choice bringing years of knowledge and experience to all of our customers. You can work in parallel with your team among many projects with leadership that's accessible and flexible to ensure personalized and agile service. We have proven success supporting clients worldwide, all of which are referenceable. We've been in business for over 20 years as noted, and along the way we've been involved in over 50 cloud implementations worldwide and over 150 plus enterprise application projects for our 200 plus enterprise clients. With that being said, I'm happy to hand the stage over to Amrita. Amrita, the floor is yours. Thank you, Marcus, and thanks all for joining. Um, as I said uh, earlier in the day on my LinkedIn post, this is not a webinar. I know we are all tired of those. Uh, thanks to COVID, uh, this is more of um, PSA, a public service announcement. It's simply because I'm passionate about uh, security and I wanted to share some crucial facts, which I think um, all of us could uh, gain from. So let's start since we have um, 25 minutes. Um, I wanted to start with this uh, joke meme, which actually talks about a really serious point. Uh, it's, it's, you know, as, as you can see, the it clown is saying that I've got all your data down here, you're perfectly safe, honest. It basically what I'm trying to say here is there is a misconception in our industry today that somehow public clouds are not as secure, uh, which basically says that, hey, if I'm on premise or if I'm on a private cloud data center, then I am more secure than a public cloud deployment, which is absolutely a misconception. But we still, and in, the, in some of the Next slides, we'll talk about why, where does that misconception come from? So before we uh, go into um, that, let's look at some quick uh, stats for 2018 to 2020, right? So the average cost of a data breach in the healthcare industry was $6.5 million. That's a good chunk of change. The total cybercrime cost in banking industry in 2018 alone was $18.3 million. So if you're in the healthcare industry or in the financial industry, you get a perk up and listen to what I have to say. Next, small businesses. That's another misconception that we have. We, for some reason, think that if I'm a small business, hey, I'm flying under the radar. Uh, of uh, these bad actors and hackers, what are they going to do? Uh, but I, I don't have any sensitive data, which is again a misconception because the definition of sensitive data has evolved. Sensitive data, uh, for instance, in California, names and addresses, full names, like full, you know, your initial, middle, last name, and your whole address is considered, a, is considered sensitive data. And if you hold any of that information for your consumers or customers in your database and you have a data breach, you're going to be fined by the California government. So uh, small businesses need to understand that they are almost equally at risk as bigger enterprises as this data shows on the screen that 43% of breach victims were small businesses. Similarly, there were 10% of the total breaches were in the financial industry, 15% was in healthcare organizations and 16% in public sector. So what is the point? What, what, what is the point that I'm trying to make here is that if you are in the financial industry or health or you're part of the healthcare organization, or if you are in the public sector, again, please pay attention. Cybersecurity is a real threat, right? And um, as you can see with the bottom statistic, 
95% of cloud security failures will be the customer's fault. Now that brings me to the next slide, which goes back about back to our misconception about public clouds not being secure. So according to Gartner, clouds are secure, right? The question to ask is, are we using them securely? So we have seen uh, every other day we see uh, some news headline about a security breach, a data breach, uh, big agencies, big um, enterprises like Capital One, Uber, and whatnot, all, all of them with giant security teams fall prey to simple breaches. And you know what? Most of the time it is the user. It is, if not always, most of the time, it will be a user that is at fault, who was not responsible enough and did not architect their environment properly and succumbed to a breach. It will almost never be the cloud provider, right? Capital One was hosted uh, on Amazon, I think, right? So it was, they did not, in that specific breach, they did not uh, use their web application firewall rules properly, which um, resulted in the breach ultimately. S3 buckets on Amazon are notorious for not being um, secured properly and which sometimes lead to data breaches. Again, it's taking Amazon again as an example, Amazon is securing their data center S3 bucket that you create under your account is your responsibility. If you don't secure that, then again, it's, it's a user issue, not a cloud provider issue. And also the recent history of public clouds, it has uh, very, very clearly demonstrated that brand name multi-tenant public cloud services like uh, AWS, Oracle Cloud, Azure, Google Cloud, they're highly resistant to attack. I mean, they have an army of cybersecurity experts and millions of dollars at their um, disposal to make their infrastructure secure. They have the economies of scale that uh, you and I can never achieve, right? So to think that traditional in-house and on-premise deployments are more secure than public clouds is folly. So that's, you know, going back to this misconception of public clouds not being secure. Public clouds are secure. We have to use them securely. Now, before we go into the next, uh, um, to the next slide, I want you guys to take a couple of seconds and ask yourself uh, this question. What are the top three things you do to stay safe online? I'm gonna give you couple of seconds. Again, think about it. What are the top three things you do to stay safe online? And did you come up with um, something like, well, I use antivirus. Uh, I use uh, really strong, complex passwords, or I only visit known websites. If you came up with any of those, well, you're, you are in the majority because that is what most people do to stay safe online. And why do I bring this up? So Google conducted this survey between two groups. Um, one group was comprised of security experts. The other group was com comprised of people like you and me who are non-experts. You know, I'm talking about certified security experts. And when they were asked um, the same question, both these groups, they had very different answers. As you can see, the light gray bars are not experts and the dark gray bars are experts. What do you see on the screen is that experts update systems, use unique passwords, use unique passwords, use multi-factor authentication, use password manager, check for HTTPS. You probably did not come up with any of these as your top three or maybe one or two. Non-experts usually will stick to antivirus, 
visit only known websites, change password, use strong password. It doesn't matter how strong your password is. If somebody is listening, when you're typing in your password and transmitting unencrypted, it does not matter how strong the password is, it will be cracked. So again, the point that I'm trying to make here is that oftentimes we think we are secure out there in the virtual world doing our things, our day-to-day -day tasks. You never know where you will trip and fall and that would cost, end up costing either you personally or your organization millions and millions of dollars. So listen to the experts. That's the point that I'm trying to make here. So what does this uh, all mean for you? What happens if you have a data breach? Uh, I mean, it's a, it's a no-brainer that compromised data can severely damage your reputation, right? And it not just affects your ability to conduct business today, but also into the future. And everybody, anyone who is running a business knows how important reputation is. And not to um, forget the financial aspect of a data breach, right? A data breach results in lawsuits and government fines, you know, sometimes class action lawsuits. That's expensive, expensive to deal with. Uh, the stats that you see here, $3.9 million average cost of a data breach. $3.9 million for a small and medium business. That's again a pretty penny. Healthcare had the highest data breach cost of $429 per record. Now it might not seem like much, but $429 per record. Healthcare organizations have millions of records. Now do the math. Lost business again is a direct financial implication. So you're paying legal fees, you're dealing with lawsuits, you're dealing with um, bureaucracy and government fines, et cetera. And then because of your damaged reputation, you're also losing business. So the financial implication of a cybersecurity breach is monumental. And as you can see, the damage related to cybercrime is projected to hit $6 trillion annually by 2021. So if you don't want to be a part of this statistic, uh, the time to act is now. The two links that you see on the screen, uh, I put them in this presentation just as it's, it's a very handy tool. Uh, essentially, Exploit Database uh, is a CBE compliant archive of uh, public exploits and corresponding vulnerable software. Right, and these have been compiled by penetration testers and vulnerable in researchers. The reason why I put this out here is oftentimes we use a lot of tools and technologies and software and have no idea what we might be vulnerable to. So this is a great place to go in to type in the tools and technologies you use, the OS you use, for instance, I'm showing you data from Microsoft Windows, um, as you can see, there have been 13 known exploits in 2020 so far, which means there are 13 exploits since 2019. There are a total of 989 exploits, which means if you're using Microsoft Windows, depending on the version, you are vulnerable to hundreds of exploits unless you fix them, you find them and you fix them. Same thing, the reason I put Linux out there is that's again a misconception. A lot of people think, oh, I'm not running anything on Windows, I'm running everything on Linux, and Linux is some, supposed to be, you know, secure. But anything that, anything that we use ultimately runs on code. Anything that runs on code is vulnerable because it can be exploited. So as you can see, there have been 10 known exploits in 2020 so far for Linux. So depending upon the flavor of Linux you use and the version, you are again vulnerable to hundreds of exploits. So now that you, um, you know, I've, I've scared you enough, what can you, what can you do? So. The three salient pillars of any security posture are to are prevent, detect, and recover. Essentially, you 
prevention is your first line of defense, right? And you cannot prevent from something you're not aware of. So arm yourself with knowledge. That is, again, your first line of defense. You need to know what the risks are. Only then you can mitigate them. So security awareness training is extremely important for your organization. I, I personally have seen people fall for phishing attacks. Phishing, everybody knows about phishing attacks. Everybody is aware of it. And yet, in the moment when you actually are subject to it, somehow you still fall for it, which is why you have to drill into everyone's brain that security is important. You have to be constantly vigilant and you have to do this over and over again. So it cannot, you cannot just talk to your organization about, hey, this is what it means and this is what you should do. You have to do it on a regular basis so it stays on top of their mind. That's why training is so important. And obviously all the other stuff that you see on the screen, use a firewall, make sure you keep up with software updates, patch, patch and patch some more. Always stay at least N minus one, if not N, with your software patches, especially when, the, when your vendors release security updates. Please patch, upgrade on a timely fashion. Please don't run Windows 2008. Please upgrade. Um, you know, again, of course, if you have your on-premise data center, make sure you control physical access like your life depends on it. Secure Wi-Fi networks. And again, this point, I want, I usually belabor this, but you have no idea how easy it is to break into a Wi-Fi um, router and access point. It is ridiculously easy. And a lot of people don't even know that it can be done, right? So make sure your Wi-Fi networks are secure and everything works on Wi-Fi now. Your printer works on Wi-Fi now. So, and of course, then there is uh, individual user accounts. You make sure that there is accountability. Without accountability, there is no responsibility. So make sure you have individual user accounts, no service accounts that, you know, five different people are using. Practice the policy of police privilege. Only provide access to data when it is justified by business. And of course, regularly change passwords. Your next line of defense is to detect. So what you cannot prevent, you want to be able to detect. And there are several tools um, at your disposal to do so. Uh, security information and event management, SIM tools like uh, Splunk and multiple others that are provided by cloud providers are very, very helpful in doing so. Same thing with antivirus and anti-malware software. Always make sure that you have antivirus and anti-malware running on each and every system. Similarly, Intrusion detection is extremely important. Please have a tool, please deploy a tool with some sort of ideas and IPS capabilities. Use web proxy technologies and set intruder traps wherever possible. So sometimes people, people are, you know, um, bad actors usually are brilliant people and they will be able to circumvent a lot of your tools, which is why you need to set traps essentially to catch them in the act. Ultimately, what you cannot prevent or detect, you have to be able to recover from. So now if you're being held hostage to your production system is being held hostage to a ransomware attack, what do you do? Do you pay millions of dollars in Bitcoins to your attacker or what's plan B? You have to have a plan B. So disaster, in this uh, post-COVID world is, has a totally different meaning. Now, when we talk about disaster, it's not just tornadoes and earthquakes, it's ransomware attacks and cryptocurrency malwares and whatnot. So make sure you have a recovery plan and it includes your proper backup and retention policies and have a working disaster recovery. 
So how do you gauge where you are on the security scale? Now that I've given you all of these um, tits and bits of information, right? How do you really know where your organization stands? Uh, the seven questions you see on the screen, these are some simple questions to ask yourself and your organization. First thing is incident management. Incident management, what do we talk, what do we mean by incident? Incident is any security incident, right? Any security incident where you've detected that there's been a breach or somebody is trying to breach or it's already data has been compromised. So that's a security incident. So how well do you detect it? Once you have detected it, are you able to accurately identify it? Once you have identified it, are you able to handle and recover from it? So that's incident management. These are good questions to ask. Ask yourself, ask your organization. Vulnerability management. We all we talked about how all of the tools and technologies we use in today's world have vulnerabilities that are just sitting there to be exploited. So how do we reduce the exposure of these vulnerabilities? And how do we identify and mitigate known vulnerabilities? That brings us to cash management. Cash management is an excellent way of uh, mitigating known vulnerabilities because known vulnerabilities have known patches. And as long as you keep updated with your cash management, you are probably going to be in better shape than without applying those patches. Configuration management is next. Configuration management basically is talking about your configuration baseline. So your firewalls, your routers, uh, your other virtual appliances, they all need to have a configuration baseline. That brings us to change management. Change management is how do you, how effective is your change management policy? How do you ensure that you're not deviating from your configuration baselines, right? Ultimately, application security is another thing that we have to ask ourselves. Oftentimes, IT people, we only talk about network security, OS security, storage, encryption, et cetera, but we forget that most end users are coming into the application layer, right? So, Business and IT have to be able to communicate uh, amongst themselves and understand where there are gaps. So we cover all our bases from both the IT infrastructure side plus the application. And finally, a quick and dirty way of figuring out where you are on the security scale is to simply ask your organization how much money they've been spending in the past years um, towards your in, uh, you know, information security. So the lesser money you've spent, uh, the, poorer, the poorer your security posture, right? So that's, that's a quick and dirty way of uh, finding out whether you need to uh, pay more attention to your security posture or not. So in conclusion, uh, what did we learn today? We learned that uh, public clouds are secure, may even be more secure than a traditional on-premise or private cloud deployment. So please don't uh, shy away from moving to public clouds because you're losing opportunity. You are losing so many benefits that the public clouds have to offer just because of a misconception. We also learned that most security breaches occur due to user error. So moving to the public cloud comes with a shared security model. Just because you're moving to AWS doesn't mean you don't have to have a security posture. You still have to have a security posture. We also learned that lack of awareness is one of the key reasons of breaches being so commonplace. Um, oftentimes, you know, personal hubris combined with lack of knowledge uh, makes us vulnerable to threats. Bad actors don't just exploit tech vulnerabilities, they also exploit human psyche. So it's important to remember that. We also learned that your um, three key things for your security posture is to prevent whatever you can't, what you can't prevent you detect, and what you cannot prevent or detect you try and recover from. And ultimately, I've given you seven questions, seven main questions to ask yourself to gauge where you are on the security scale. 
with that, I will conclude uh, whatever I had to talk about today. And uh, thank you so much, guys, for suffering through the last um, well, 27 minutes uh, listening to me ramble about security. But again, um, this is something that I'm passionate about, and uh, I want to spread some awareness. And as part of that, um, I'm actually offering pro bono information security consulting. Uh, two days worth to the first three people that will email me after this webinar. You can see my email right there. That's amapurgy at vigilant-inc.com. Again, doing this to spread holiday cheer, you know, giving Tuesday. And uh, I also promised a Linux uh, security scorecard uh, as a takeaway. And I will. Uh, send, please email me for that as well. I will send you guys a copy. And um, okay, it looks like there is a, what are, there's a question. We are on top of, um, we're close to our, and I'm going to try and answer it. What are the keys for the security management? Um, I'm not really sure I understand that question, are we talking about encryption keys or are we talking about key recommendations? If you're talking about key recommendation, if I could sum it up uh, in just one sentence, um, you know, be like my mother, her answer, her default answer to every question is no, right? So your, your default setting to um, access to anything that is related to security opening firewall ports, et cetera, allowing inbound access, make it a default deny all. That will be uh, the basis for everything that is security related. Be rude, say no, uh, deny all. I don't see any other questions. There is a comment saying this was a great session. Um, thank you so much. That's, that's good, good feedback. And uh, if you guys have anything else that you want to pick my brain for, please feel free to reach out to me. And, um, and you, you'll see my email right here. I'll post it on the LinkedIn event page as well. All right. Thank you guys. Happy holidays.